Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, to all the panelists, you may now uh, open your camera. We will start the webinar now. Welcome, everyone. Okay, so we'll start now, yeah. Um, Assalamualaikum and a very good morning to Yang Bahagia Datuk Dr. Sabirin bin Jaafar, the Director General of the Maritime Institute of Malaysia, distinguished speakers and moderators, as well as webinar participants. On behalf of MIMA, it gives us a great pleasure to extend to you all a welcome to this webinar on climate change adaptation towards seaports development in Malaysia. We are very pleased to have your interest in attending this webinar virtually, taking time off your busy schedule for this knowledge sharing event. The webinar aims to determine the impacts of climate change at the seaport and how the free and open Indo-Pacific FOIP strategy supports the region through the identification of methods and best practices available in adapting to the impacts of climate change towards seaport development. To begin this webinar, we are delighted to invite Yang Bahagia, Dr. Datuk Dr. Sabirin bin Jaafar, the Director General of Maritime Institute of Malaysia, to deliver his opening remarks. Please welcome Yang Bahagia Datuk. Thank you, Alice. Honorable speakers, participants, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, salam sejahtera. And a very good morning to everyone. It gives me great pleasure to welcome everyone to this webinar. Let me begin by thanking the Embassy of Japan in Malaysia for collaborating with MIMA to organize this webinar titled Climate Change Impacts and Adaptation Towards Seaports Development in Malaysia. The climate is changing. And this trend is expected to continue for the rest of the century. Climate change has an impact on numerous areas and economic sectors. It is also causing problems for ports and the marine industry. Port cities and port operations face operational issues as a result of this. Without urgent mitigation, this f this effects the effects of marine change or the effects of climate change are expected to be more severe making adaptation a challenge for seaports and its link infrastructure's future sustainability in this regard malaysia and japan play a role in supporting a sustainable environment including minimizing the impact of climate change at ports to ensure no interruptions. We are pleased to note that Japan's free and open Indo-Pacific strategy supports marine environment, supports marine environmental protection in the region, which is crucial for a prosperous and sustainable maritime domain. With this background, the webinar today aims to discuss and hear from the experts on issues of climate change at seaports in the region and look at the best practices that could be useful to mitigate the I am they tribute greatly through knowledge, ladies and gentlemen and views and sharing of best practices and experiences from Malaysia, Japan, and the region today will help in further shaping and streamlining actions on bolstering and identifying suitable mitigation measures for the seaports development. I would like to once again thank the Embassy of Japan in Malaysia for joining MIMA to support the webinar. With that, I wish you all a fruitful session today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Yabagi Dato, for your inspiring speech. Uh, we will now move on to our next agenda. We will start with our photo session before we start the panel discussion. So we, before we begin, 
please allow us a couple of your minutes of your time to have a photo session. So to the panelists, please switch on your camera, Dato, your camera also, and post this with your biggest smile. Okay, everyone ready? All right. Smile, one, two, three. One, two, three. One more. One, two, three. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you, Dato. So we will now start with our panel discussion. First, ladies and gentlemen, we will now, uh, before passing the screen to uh, continue our next agenda, let me first make a brief introduction of, of our esteemed moderator, Mr. Tirupati Rao from Petronas. So Mr. Tirupati has an interesting 23 years of vast experience in the field of greenhouse gas, carbon and energy management, as well as electrical engineering. Tapping on the sustainable development background, he also had experiences in developing climate change strategies and policies for large organizations, where over the years of his working days, he had led successful registration of 12 carbon credit projects in Malaysia under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC, which then qualify both Southeast Asia and Malaysia for their first carbon credit. In 2010, he was also one of the consultants to the Malaysia Green Technology Roadmap. Uh, currently, Mr. Tirupati is working for Petronas as the head of climate change based in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. He has been instrumental in the development and implementation of climate actions, such as Petronas' position and framework on climate change, and also Petronas' carbon commitment, including the introduction of internal carbon price and CCUS requirements. And the latest ad addition to Mr. Tirupati's contribution to his enthusiastic interest in climate change is Petronas' net zero carbon emission by 2050. With that, Mr. Tirupati, we will now pass to you to moderate the session. Mr. Tirupati. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Uh, yeah, good morning, uh, Dato, uh, Dr. Sabrin and uh, uh, fellow uh, panelists. Right, good morning. Uh, it's a, a great opportunity uh, to discuss about adaptation and talk about cl climate change. Uh, often people don't um, discuss much about adaptation, thinking that this is something far away. We often talk about emission reductions and uh, technologies related to green technologies and so on. Uh, adaptation is always a little bit overlooked, um, but this is a good uh, session. Thank you for the um, MIMA to take stepping up for this and also uh, Japanese uh, embassy here on, on um, uh, facilitating this process. So um, we have uh, four panel uh, speakers today distinguished panel speakers from various backgrounds, from academics, from the industry, um, going to share on adaptation. Um, in terms of adaptation, there's uh, two angles, right? Um, one is uh, extreme weather events that are going to become more intense and more frequent. A second part is the slow process of uh, transformation of these uh, climate hazards, example, sea level rise, uh, ocean acidification due to CO, CO2 dissolved in the seawater and increasing uh, the corrosion um, exponentially. And most of our uh, uh, oil and gas and as well as uh, maritime structures are steel and this um, poses a big threat as well. So uh, just to highlight, these are some of the issues that we need to understand besides the hurricane um, and um, typhoons, droughts, floods and so on. Uh, the the slow uh, processes of climate change of sea level rise and ocean acidification is also uh, quite uh, detrimental for the industry. Right. With uh, that, let me uh, go with the first uh, speaker that we have is from um, Captain uh, K. Subramaniam. Um, kept, he's a general manager in Port Plank Authority. Uh, Captain uh, has begun his career in uh, merchant uh, marine Marine in 1981, that's a long time back, uh, uh, and obtained his uh, captaincy in 1992. He joined the uh, Port Kalang uh, Authority in 1994 as a harbor pilot and held several designations before being appointed as a general manager in 2016. 
becoming the first uh, scholar sponsored uh, by P It's here. Uh, if we do not, uh, we do not take action now. Of course, uh, I think it may be too late for us to turn things around. So on that, um, I, I also think it's not too late for me to wish everyone a happy New Year, twenty twenty three. I'm really pleased to be uh, in 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 the company of uh, to Dr. Sabrin Jaffa, Dr. Dr. Sabrin. Uh, thank you for this opportunity uh, uh, from me. So, uh, I, I believe you're given about 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, I've got a few slides, but I, I'm just going to use that as uh, a reference. Let me share those slides first. Can you see the slides here? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, yes. great. All right. Uh, let me start by by uh, explaining, or, or I mean, this is I think a, a very common knowledge. Uh, how important uh, seaports and sea transportation uh, is for maritime trade around the world. Yeah, uh, I think it's a, it is. I think it's a fact that uh, we require sea transportation to carry our trade uh, economically. Uh, and I think during the pandemic, we realized how important maritime uh, transportation is. And that was the only transportation that was moving around the world uh, during the pandemic. And we also know that, you know, when, when the pandemic set in, uh, borders were closed and uh, airlines were one of the first that were affected. And when airlines stopped flying, uh, the transportation of cargo uh, via air was was disrupted completely. Uh, you know, more than fifty percent of air cargo actually travels in the bellies of commercial aircrafts. Uh, so when commercial aircraft stopped flying, uh, they were they were actually caught in a situation where cargo could not be transported quickly. But luckily, we had the maritime transport that was still operating, despite all the the hiccups, despite some of the difficulties they faced. Uh, it, it it continued to serve the, the, the whole global economy uh, during the two and a half years that, that we were going through a very, very difficult time. So if you look at this particular uh, chart here, uh, it shows the connectivity uh, of, of different regions, different continents uh, via maritime transportation. And 80% of our trade is carried by sea. That's a fact. Uh, and... That's how important it is uh, for the global economy. So uh, in 2021, 850 million TEUs of, of containers alone uh, moved across uh, the globe. And uh, that was worth close to about 28.5 trillion US dollars. So that was how huge it, it was. And you know, I think very quickly, we know, even during uh, in 2021, we had some issues in Suez when one of the ships ran aground. And for seven days, I think the, the canal, uh, Suez Canal was closed to international traffic. And it was chaotic. Uh, Far East Europe trade was completely at a standstill, uh, both ways. Uh, ships were required to go around the Cape of Good Hope. That's an additional 10 to 12 days of sailing. Uh, Impacting ports. You know, many ports, uh, the engineering structure of ports are built on an optimum scale. 
uh, we take uh, into consideration the local weather pattern, uh, worst case scenario normally, uh, the rise and fall of tides, uh, plus occasionally when we have uh, storms and, and so on. But generally in Malaysia, we are in a, a fairly protected area uh, as compared to many parts of the world. So we don't really see uh, serious uh, weather patterns around this area. Uh, we are in Port Lang, especially in Malaysian ports around the peninsula of Malaysia, we are well protected. Uh, but that is not to say that we have not noticed any change uh, in the weather pattern recently. Uh, I'm sure you all would have heard how Malaysia was affected by a bad flood sometime in uh, uh, late 2021. And uh, the, you know, the, the, the Klang Valley, most parts of Klang Valley, uh, where the capital city of Putrajaya and Kuala Lumpur is, uh, are located, uh, both of these areas were also inundated by flood waters. But so ports generally, we do take into consideration the pattern, weather pattern, the rise and fall of tides, but that is built on an optimum uh, level. Relook at the design of ports now. So if we are going to redesign the structure of ports or the, the engineering aspects of ports, then certainly there will be a new technology that goes in and it's going to add to the cost as well. So uh, we are looking at even erosions, uh, navigational channel, uh, sedimentation, uh, damage to uh, equipment and structures. And all this is going to amount to an increase in costs uh, in, in operating and maintaining ports. So what have we done uh, here uh, in, in, in Port Lang uh, and around Malaysian ports? Uh, I believe uh, we are in line with what's being done in other parts of the world. Everybody is taking stock of what we need to do. So first of all, we have to identify where are the areas that we need to work on. And generally, we have seen that the source of emissions of uh, CO2 and uh, greenhouse gases are actually from the ones that I've just listed on the left here. If you look at ports, uh, we started off, uh, you know, many years ago using uh, traditional uh, equipment that were driven by uh, either fuel or even uh, electricity. So we had some form of electrification already in port equipment some 20 years ago, but that was only for the large equipments, including the key cranes uh, and, 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 and possibly the lighting and so on. But when we looked at other equipment like the uh, warehouse equipment or forklifts, looking at uh, uh, equipment like uh, straddle carriers or rubber tire gantries, or even the terminal trucks or terminal tractors that we were using to convey the, the cargo from the ship uh, from the wharf side to the stacking area to the storage yards, they were all still driven by uh, fossil fuel or, or diesel fuel. So that's one major uh, uh, source of uh, emission. Uh, we also know that uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, problems with energy efficiency uh, in ports. We were using equipment that were a lot less efficient than what we have now. So that was another area that we had to look at. So overall, we, we are moving towards more electrification of equipment and uh, we're looking at even monitoring uh, very closely on carbon emissions uh, within the port area. Uh, we're even looking at uh, ships, uh, how they behave when they come into the ports, whether they will be able to be convinced that they have to do something in port uh, to reduce the emissions as well. So all in all, uh, we we have come up with even uh, some strategies on use of renewable energy. Uh, it is a policy for us now to look at uh, rooftop uh, photovoltaic cells uh, to cover all rooftop of uh, new construction of warehouses uh, to ensure that we are able to tap into uh, solar energy. And uh, eventually, all this will lead to green and sustainable port policies, which will be good on the long run. 
So looking at the other half of, uh, of our partners, uh, I mean, ships and ports go together. So uh, shipping is another area that, uh, that contributes a lot. And shipping has, is, in, in, in my opinion, shipping is well-regulated. Uh, you know, the custodian of shipping today is the International Maritime Organization, uh, of which almost all countries around the globe are members. And therefore, there are a lot of uh, uh, discussions going on uh, at this forum at the IMO. And there has been many strategies, uh, many legislations, many best practices that has been developed by IMO that has been adopted by, by uh, member nations uh, looking at uh, reducing uh, uh, emissions. So if you remember in 2020, uh, there was a drive towards uh, lowering the, the sulfur content of fuel, uh, bunker fuel on ships. Uh, bunker fuel was, was known to be one of the major source of emissions. And while we were on a 3.5% sulfur uh, content uh, at that time in 2020, uh, IMO uh, legislated that the uh, sulfur content will be reduced to 0 0.5. Of course, initially there was some, some uh, issues with the availability of such uh, low sulfur bunkers around the world, but that was eventually sorted out. You know? uh, so there's always a, a, a fear when we, we come out with new uh, initiatives, uh, whether the industry will be able to cope. But uh, I believe over the years, uh, it has been proven that industries, industry is able to cope uh, and they are willing to give full cooperation. Uh, of course, today we have moved to uh, low carbon fuels, uh, including LNG and biofuels. Of course, going forward, we have to look at uh, you know, long-term sustainable fuels that are fossil, fossil free. And that is something that uh, there's a lot of research that is going on. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are, we are also looking at shore power supply at, at vessels at berths. Uh, this is to encourage ships from uh, not using or discourage ships from using their generators while they are in port uh, and try to reduce emissions from the generators. So uh, this is a, a strategy in many ports around the world today, but it, it's not easy for us to convert existing wharfs uh, to have them uh, installed with short power supply. Therefore, uh, in Port Klang, we have made it a policy for any future uh, port expansion. This will be one of the driving points. And shipping uh, today, you know, they, they have uh, uh, gone into many uh, initiatives. One of them is recently, if you know, notice, uh, IMO has announced the establishment of green shipping corridors. Uh, what it means is, uh, you know, there will be uh, areas in the oceans where uh, ships will be required to actually comply to certain uh, regulations in terms of the quality of fuel that they use, the technology they use on board, the type of engines that they're using. And uh, this green shipping corridors uh, eventually uh, will be established, I believe, around the world. So I'm sure there are uh, other incentives that goes into this for, for ships to be using this green shipping corridors. Uh, and of course, you can see at the bottom end is uh, the design of ships itself. So today, IMO is legislating the design and construction of ships. Uh, they are driving on low carbon fuel, uh, eventually going on non-fossil fuels. They're looking at energy efficiency on board ships, uh, on ways of to measure uh, carbon emissions, and eventually uh, coming out with a formula whether they could either incentivize the, the, uh, the performance of ships uh, and also possibly even penalize them if they are not complying with the regulations. So uh, the other driver that we are looking today is digitalization. We have seen for the for, for longest time, and this was widely exposed during the, uh, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, um, how we realized that our communication and interaction between the parties in the supply chain was so poor that uh, a lot of uh, areas around the world uh, could not cope up with, uh, with the business uh, and uh, of delivery of goods. And we realized that those who had invested in digitalizations were actually a step ahead. So 
the lessons learned from uh, COVID-19 was digital, digitalization was the way forward. And we realized uh, in, in, in the port and logistics and shipping uh, industry, uh, there is already a, a certain degree of digitalization taking place. Uh, but what, what was uh, discovered was this process was done in isolation uh, within certain sectors, within certain companies. So the part of connectivity uh, between different uh, parties was poor. Now, all it's all about data exchange, right? If you have data exchange uh, done digitally, uh, things will move faster. And we have we can do away with paper transactions and and transactions will be able to be uh, you know to be moved faster. So uh, data exchange is one of the biggest areas that we are working on today. And therefore, I think uh, you know yesterday I was in a in a in a symposium at, at IMO online, and we were talking about the introduction of the maritime single window, which is coming into force on first January twenty twenty four where all ports uh, are required to provide a maritime single window for exchange of data between shore and ship authorities. So this is a good way forward uh, where ships can quickly uh, share their information with, with ports so that their arrival and departures are all you know, expedited without any unnecessary delays and therefore they can just come into the port and, and, and get, get into the port and do their their, their cargo operations and leave as soon as possible. Uh, the other area, of course, that shipping lines are, are always requesting is uh, whether ports can you know, efficiently deal with their operations. One way is uh, today uh, we, we have uh, ships arriving in ports, but you know, steaming at high speeds, arriving at ports, and then not having a wharf to go alongside to. And what happens, they have to wait here for hours, sometimes days, and uh, this is not economical at all uh, to, to either the port or the ships. So the shipping industry today is requiring that ports perform step up and provide information, exchange data, though, so that the ship can adjust their, their ETAs, their estimated time of arrivals, uh, so that they can berth on arrival. So we, it's another concept of just, just in time. So this is where the need for sharing of data comes in. The need for AI to be to be uh, built in into our 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 systems uh, and good prediction tools uh, to be incorporated. So uh, these are areas that we are we are working on uh, today. I just want to share with you a little bit on what we are doing at the international level, of which uh, Malaysian ports are also part of this uh, the IAPH. Uh, the IPH has started uh, several programs on port sustainability, and one of them is the Environmental Ship Index, where uh, we work with uh, another agency to actually measure the, uh, the carbon index, uh, emission index uh, of ships. Not only the emission index, there's quite a few uh, criteria that we actually measure, including energy efficiency uh, and so on. And... Uh, we provide them with a scorecard or, a, or an index, which is then uh, which reflects the the uh, the you know the, the status of that ship. Uh, how green is that ship? And when they go into ports, uh, we hope port authorities and port operators are able to recognize this and provide some sort of uh, incentives for them. Uh, because this is these are things that oh, it's over and above regulatory requirements. So many ships today, or many ship owners today, are investing into uh, technology and green fuels uh, in order to scale up quickly. And uh, this is the part that needs a bit more recognition and needs a bit more incentives uh, to shipping. So in Port Klang, very quickly, if you look from the top, uh, as I spoke earlier, renewable energy, solar panels are already there. We have also started on LNG bunkering. We are working with our local uh, uh, oil company, uh, Petronas, on supplying uh, LNG bunkering here in Port Klang. Uh, in Malaysia, it's, it's a huge reservoir for, for, for LNG. Uh, we also have ports uh, are able to handle LNG. We have LNG installations, LNG storage facilities. So it's not really a problem for formulation ports actually 
uh, to provide LNG bunkering. Uh, environment protection is a, is a major thing we are looking at, you know, uh, waste management from ships, not only from ships, even from port activities. They have to be managed very carefully so that, uh, you know, it, it is taken care of uh, in, a, in a manner that is sustainable. Uh, and therefore, ports have uh, set up uh, reception facilities within the port area. And uh, we ensure that such waste uh, that we receive from the ships are properly seg segregated uh, and uh, they are then uh, recycled at the approved facilities. Nature is our biggest uh, you know, uh, safeguard. Uh, we just spoke about earlier about um, you know, very uh, drastic weather patterns today changing around the world. Uh, vegetation, natural vegetation is the best buffer uh, for ports. And in our Malaysian ports, we are located in an area where uh, we were endowed with uh, a good, huge uh, areas of uh, mangrove plantation. But as we develop the ports and as, as uh, a development set in in many other industries around the port, uh, we realized that they, it was having a negative impact on vegetation, especially on mangrove swamps. And uh, this is a program now we have taken uh, very seriously with our terminal operators, as well as the stakeholders around the port, uh, where we participate in programs of mangrove replanting. So we have huge areas uh, of green swaths of mangroves now, which are young, healthy, uh, which have been planted over seven or eight years ago, which are really, really thriving. So we are really proud to see this coming up. Uh, but you know, more has to be done uh, to safeguard this vegetation. Uh, future projects, I think I spoke about this earlier, so I'll not want to repeat them. Uh, on the equipment um, uh, upgrades and the use of technology, uh, we are uh, embarking on a replacement program for diesel RTGs as well as uh, introducing more hybrid and uh, uh, electrified RTGs. So, uh, quickly to end, uh, my this, I think this is my last slide. Uh, on the international front, uh, there's so much of work go is going on in, in, in the world. I think there's so many bodies that are working at international levels, trying to bring parties together from, you know, from community levels, scale them up to national levels, and eventually uh, work, uh, you know, uh, within between regions and on the international front. And I think this is where the engagement with our stakeholders and local communities is the best starting ground. We have to start local. We have to look around us and see what's happening in our own area, our own industry, and, and how we can uh, bring about changes uh, towards uh, addressing climate change. So uh, I'm, not, I'm not promoting any of this here, but what I'm saying is, uh, these uh, bodies that like the IMO, APEC, IAPH, uh, and the Global Maritime Forum uh, have already embarked on many programs. And they are not just working at, I at inter international uh, levels, but they actually run programs at local levels. So as I said, uh, this is where we nurture uh, the, the need for us to ensure that uh, things that are done in our ports uh, in our industries locally, uh, we need to move them towards more greener approach uh, to ensure that we're able to address uh, greenhouse gases and carbon emissions uh, towards addressing climate change. So in conclusion, I think uh, these are the actions that I would like to uh, you know, uh, advocate here. Uh, we need to take quick actions to tackle the environmental issues uh, and we need to have clear strategies, you know, clear strategies starting at local level uh, to address challenges and disruptions, especially uh, promote the use of digital technology in every aspect of the port and shipping industry. Uh, in our commitment to reduce greenhouse gases is, is not easy. Uh, I know there's a lot of financial costs involved. Every sector you go to, one of the biggest hurdles is always financial uh, component. But that is not an excuse because if we do not invest today and, and, and slowly move towards uh, a, a period where we are able to address this, I believe many industries may not even be in existence. So uh, while looking at uh, assistance from, from uh, various parties, including governments uh, and, and, 
and other parties, in, including you know bankable investors or bankable investments coming in. Uh, I think today we have many options to deal with the financial component. And lastly, of course, continuous planning and development uh, of resilient infrastructure and services is a necessity for us to meet future challenges. Ladies and gentlemen, with that, thank you so much for your time. Uh, and I, I hope uh, I've been able to give you some sort of uh, uh, information on, on climate change and what the ports are doing here in Malaysia, and also a little bit on the global perspective at all, uh, together uh, with, with that. Thank you so much. Back to you, uh, Mr. Thiru. Ah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Captain Subra. That was an interesting uh, presentation. Um, we have covered uh, various angles of uh, mitigating uh, climate actions as well as uh, building resilience uh, in your port operations as well. We'll, we'll uh, uh, wait for the question and answer session. Uh, the way it works is uh, we will uh, go to the next speaker and then um, after all the speakers, then we'll have a question and answer session. Right. Okay. So now um, let's go into the uh, second speaker. Um, we have um, T.S. Dr. Nod Zaitun bin uh, Binti Yahya. Uh, she's a senior lecturer in uh, Faculty of uh, Engineering Technology and Informatics uh, from University of Malaysia, Trenggano. Um, her experience um, is also a lengthy uh, experience here that, that to read uh, uh, and uh, explain to you. And um, she has been um, teaching since uh, 2004. Um, and supervising undergraduate and uh, postgraduate uh, students. Um, she completed um, a PhD uh, from University of Leeds in uh, UK and master's in uh, University Science uh, Malaysia, USM. And then um, she holds uh, an accredited uh, higher academy of U UK for professional qualification for teaching and learning uh, with careers, uh, the letter uh, AHEA. Dr. No uh, was also appointed as a professional technologist by uh, MBOT. And then um, Dr. No's uh, research uh, largely focused on the development of air quality industrial and quarry related um, artificial intelligence models, the AI, that's the, the buzzword today, big data AI, uh, especially related to nanoparticles, uh, welfare and safety, and environmental uh, environment instrumentations. So that's a, a connection of two different worlds, um, digital and environment. Um, and uh, she has been uh, successful in uh, getting a lot of grants uh, for a few millions uh, for some of her projects. And uh, she has been um, uh, keynote speakers for almost uh, 17 conferences. Eh? A lot, uh, and she published 11 journals and 19 publications of books, various proceedings, papers and presentation. Uh, and 27 was a keynote invited speaker in local and international conferences for almost a decade now. And um, her research uh, titled My Atmos, I think is part of her presentation later uh, in this topic, uh, has been a novel method uh, for using big data. And she won a gold medal in uh, 27th International Invention um, and Innovation Exhibition in 2016. Right. Um, the list goes on, and uh, she's also founder of many, many uh, organizations uh, throughout her career. That's the most uh, important. So important thing. So innovation is built in in her DNA. <laughs> she has been uh, founding a lot of uh, 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 associations like uh, Clean Air Forum, Society of Malaysia, MICAS since 2014. Um, there's a huge fund, 1.5 billion, to support the events. Um, and uh, she's also a former vice president. Uh, for Committee of uh, Transportation Science Society for Malaysia, also founder for first president for the Malaysian Postgraduate, Postgraduate Association of UK, um, and um, she was uh, a director for one of the Asia's largest conference for 10th Better Air Quality Conference in Kuching during the MCO period. And um, Dr. Zaitun took many efforts to build uh, build up teams from various parties, from five government and uh, 15 non-government organizations. Uh, so these efforts have continued until today and uh, activities to introduce awareness on environmental issues and human health are very much um, highlighted in her uh, CV. It's a very long CV. Uh, I tried my best to shorten it uh, as much as possible. 
So over to you, uh, uh, Dr. Mirzaitun. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Piru. Uh, good, uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi and very good morning to all. Can you hear me all? Good, eh? Yes. All right. Okay. Uh, Honorable uh, Director General Datuk Dr. Sabirin Jaafar and Mr. Our Chairman today, Mr. Tiru, uh, our Honorable Speakers, uh, Captain Subra Maniam, uh, Dr. Hiroshi from Japan and Professor Miguel Estevan. Okay, and all the uh, uh, participants today. Uh, it's a very great pleasure for me today by, uh, given by MIA to be a one of the speaker in this very good I mean, floor to discuss about the very important thing, the climate change. So let me share uh, my presentation first. Mm. Okay. All right. Let me share. Okay. So uh, because I'm a, I may be talking about in the different, a bit different angle because I am a, a academician and the most of my work focus on the research and research and also we also have a collaboration with the industries and part of my work also I'm a president of the Clean Air Society Forum of Malaysia whereby we have a various contact with the uh, in the, uh, you know the government and industries uh, not only in Malaysia because uh, the Clean Air Society Forum of Malaysia we are the under also affiliation with the Clean Air Asia under UNEP and also we are the board member of the World Clean Air Congress. Yeah, the World Clean Air Congress is uh, the world uh, largest uh, clean air association in the world, uh, where now the president is Professor Salahati Injiji from Turkey, and uh, we have uh, more than forty countries uh, in the in the association. So uh, this is my about my presentation. This is just uh, for my I mean guideline. I will give some introduction to the topic about about the the, the port industry and narrow my uh, presentation on the air quality or the environmental issues okay and we will go to the sustainable port parameter something that what should we focus especially on the environment and also i will share right um, status on the environment testers in port cities especially in in malaysia although we have uh, all the data for the all over malaysia data for the air quality uh, we, we also focus on certain cities uh, uh, whereby near to the to the port, for example, Klang, Bintulu, and many more in Malaysia. Uh, and finally, we got go to the recommendation and maybe conclusion. And some of the information has been shared by um, uh, Captain. Just now, very very impressive and very lot of information that also uh, very good for us to open up our mind today about the importance of this uh, climate change issue. And we, as we are aware, although either we are involved or not, but involved in climate change uh, mitigation or whatever, but every every single of us people, you know, the people all are uh, facing this uh, phenomena. For example, global warming. We also have uh, several flood, uh, rain uh, pattern, monsoon coming. For example, I'm from the east coast of Malaysia. The monsoon coming, uh, not that. A normal situation, the rain, for example, fall, not like the pre previous year. Now, uh, the, 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 the condition or the climate really, really show the, the differences. And the, the sea water level, um, University of Malaysia, Terengganu, just next to the, the sea. And we can, we also uh, update the, the situation or the level of sea that are increasing that would also affect the, the land or the people indirectly for sure. So then I will start with the what we call what want to know about the port sustainability defined as a strategies and activity that a port undertake to meet the current and future needs of those who use it while protecting and sustaining human and natural resource. So why we we discuss this topic and why we the port authority and the, all those are related to uh, shipping industry uh, very important is because to to protect eh, to protect and to sustain human and natural resource these are the two things that really really, really very uh, critical and uh, serious uh, for us to discuss and also uh, for our association at the world level at the asia level we are really focused on on the environment we need to do something to buy today 
to maintain the to maintain the good environment that will be given to the next generation. So there are some analysis of the pot. There are a lot of uh, researcher and papers out there uh, in the journal. For example, this one or that I highlighted here, uh, analysis of the pot sustainability parameter through Bayesian network. There are many ways they are assessing the uh, do you know the pot sustainability and for this one this paper for example the eu for example reporting that implementing sustainable measures are in accordance with the gri proposal global reporting initiative that is very very important uh, to support uh, the international initiative uh, to mitigate the 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 pollution or to to support the sustainable so they come up with four yeah? they come up with four uh, dimension of sustainability development. So we are if we are talking about sustainable development, we need to have four components. The first institute in institutional dimension, the institutional itself. For example, just now, uh, uh, Captain mentioned about the uh, clown pot, and they have a lot of things. They have a lot of effort that has been taken and in plan schedule. For sure, this is very very important. Second, uh, the uh, on the left, environmental dimension. So this is about. Uh, environment when we are talking about environment actually the component main component of environment is air water and land huh? air water and land good Th this these three three components very very important and it interrelated each other we are not talking just air separately over there and land at the other angle and also uh, maybe water another one we we, we now at this uh, during this i mean uh, uh, situation to mitigate the climate change may, may have impact, we said that we need to have like a co co collaboration. The environmental should be taken holistic, not only uh, separately. So there's something that I would like to highlight here. And also we are also looking for, for the future, for the next forum or something to discuss about this. And also for sure, the economical dimension, uh, the impact that Prof, uh, Captain mentioned just now, a lot of us since um, uh, lately, a lot of cargo here and there. I can see from the map here and there. I do also aware that Selat Melaka, Selat Melaka is one of the busiest, eh? the busiest, uh, what call it, uh, Selat, straight, eh? Selat Melaka itu. Very because there's a, like a, a link between east and west. Eh? Yeah, there is it. So with that, the busy, a lot of ship come come and go over there. So for sure the environmental issues or the environmental impact uh, really need to be focused by Malaysia. And for sure, <clears throat> not to forget the so social dimension. So these are the four, uh, the social mean the people, the people and the impact to the social of the, the people and also uh, anything related to uh, the, the, the human uh, factor, right? So therefore objective for each sustainability dimension uh, and on the environmental target, so means that we need to respect the environment, the people, all the uh, the industry player in the in the in this context, the port authorities and and others, the government, for example, need to respect the environment. Really, we need to um, take that one into consideration. Minimize the environmental impact. So these are the thing that really to be in mind. Minimize environmental accident as well. The accident. Uh, if any accident occur, uh, spilling or, or any accident that can uh, split the, for example, uh, the ship accident and that can give an uh, impact to the to the environment and also to the, the fish and all the, the, the animal or whatever, either in the water or also in the, uh, on the land. And also target, uh, social target, I also mentioned about now just now, develop and modernize the management system of human resource create a motivated and committee, committed team. So these are also very, very important committed team. We need to build the committee. We, we need to build the, uh, the team, not only within the authority, within the, the, the port industry, for example, but also the community, uh, okay? Uh, community uh, uh, along the, uh, also around, around, around the, the, the port or the, any uh, activity industries. Uh, uh, achieve, sustain, and active support. Uh, for example, now, uh, as I aware, we are, uh, the government also uh, introduced the what I call uh, CSR, CSR program. I also saw just now from your slide, uh, Captain, uh, you also have uh, like CSR, whereby the, the company go to the community, doing something to the community to bring up the, the area or 
to to the uh, the people and also economic target for sure to increase the turnover increase concession revenue uh, reduce debt risk and finally the institutional target promote legal changes yes you did mention about the all the legal all the what call regulation changes uh, for example the one that i really noticed about you mentioned about the sulfur level uh, from the for the fuel uh, reduced from the 3.5% to 0.5% uh, in 2020. That is very quite, for me, from, from the aspect of uh, academician or uh, expert, that is quite a big uh, reduction. Uh, but anyway, there, there's a high time for the, the, the industry to, to look into and seriously give a committed. Although there are, I am very sure, not that easy and a big challenge for the ship, you know, on the on the on the at the sea, a lot of ship uh, whereby they already you know adapt with the the the, the previous technology, previous way this and that. So to shift from one to another, another to shift from suffer level even from three point five percent to zero point five percent, it may take some some time uh, for the not only on the technical aspect but also for the financial and also for the people to uh, to uh, use with also uh, how do uh, ports affect the air quality so today i would like to just focus on the air quality uh, so therefore how, how does that will affect so for your information of us if we can see i got this one from statista the information about how cruise ship poll pollution compared to cars just want to compare but the ship and also the car in on uh, on the on the land so for example uh, from at the barcelona so more than uh, the uh, cruise ship 32800 uh, uh, cruise ship kilogram of sol was produced by by ship but for the but for the car total is only 6812 it's very huge very what call it very far uh, 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 different compared to the ship uh, and the car. Uh, so that, that when we're talking about, yes, we also involved with the plan Induk Udara Bersih Kebangsaan Langit Biru for the Malaysian, uh, whereby we also discuss about the industry, like port industry, other industry. We, we talk about the, the pollution in urban environment. We say that uh, the urban environment is like uh, so, so many cars, congestion, this and that. We say that Oh, there's a lot of uh, emission from the motor vehicles. But then if we compare, uh, we are not have a comparison with in Malaysia right now. But if we have a look of this, we can see that even though the car, we have many cars on the land, but if we compare with the ship uh, emission, uh, especially SO2 or sulfur outside, okay, from one of the two main pollutants from ship emission, it would give us some uh, indication that we need to look back and do something, do some research, do uh, to get more uh, information about the current situation for Malaysia. For sure, study also showed that maritime traffic cost, maritime traffic cost about 50% premature death in Europe each year during increasing of air pollution. So that's why they in, in the EU, EU country, they have quite good, uh, uh, what call it, quite good uh, research uh, institute. They have funding. They have sufficient of expertise to do this type of research that will give us some uh, insight, more detail, how the, uh, the increment of air pollution, for example, will affect the premature death, will affect the, 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 the life length span, for example. Uh, so there are things that, we, uh, I, I just highlight here uh, to give some um, to understanding so that we can think of uh, what's next future. So, uh, how do ship affect the local air? For example, uh, heavy fuel, yeah, the heavy fuel, as we can see from the right hand side, uh, the, the most uh, pollutant that most, uh, uh, the, what I call uh, 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 seriously being discussed is SO2, uh, SOS, and also NOS, but there are also CO2. Eh? Uh, I am also very concerned about CO2 because CO2, this CO2 uh, linked to climate change, linked to the uh, global warming and others. Uh, also, PM is a particular matter and, and non-methane, uh, VOC, volatile organic compound. And not to forget, uh, apart from air pollution, the, 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 the ship also uh, have a noise, again, okay, noise, 
Ammonia and also oil spreads. Okay, oil spreads and also solid waste that you uh, prof, uh, Captain mentioned just now. So the IMO just imposed new regulation in January 2021 uh, to significantly reduce heavy fuel consumption, the one that uh, Captain also mentioned. Second, the diesel, which also caused respiratory problem. Uh, in some time in 2012, yeah, the WHO uh, released the, the information that diesel engine, yeah, diesel, the, the, not diesel engine, the diesel fuel can, is a carcinogen. A carcinogen is something that can cause cancer. Uh, so the diesel engine. So if the if we still remain the, using the diesel engine with a low grade of uh, sulfur, for example, that will for sure will give give an impact to the to the human health. And the third one, uh, marine gas oil and alternative to heavy fuel, which is fuel lower in sulfur content. So marine gas oil is uh, one of the ocean. Maybe this also uh, need to be explored more. And how can uh, marine gas oil uh, can replace the, the one that is being used by the ship uh, currently? Oh, uh, there are the, uh, the picture here on the right hand side. Another one shows the um, one of the what call a number fraction of uh, particles, eh? uh, particles uh, that emitted from this uh, the, the ship. So this also uh, so, uh, some of the research that may be very interesting that that they can be uh, what call uh, can be done in Malaysia. Uh, for example, maybe I would like to also highlight that we in Mal University Malaysia Terengganu we have this uh, not 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 the vessel like a ship. Uh, what call a research RV risk this risk discovery. We have this ship whereby able to, to, to do some research on the ship. We can bring the all the instrument, yeah? instrument, uh, air monitoring or whatever uh, on the ship, and then we can uh, do a mission. Okay, from the Kuala Terengganu to uh, Malaysia, Peninsula to Langkawi, and also uh, to other region of this Southeast Asia. So very interesting if we can start with this uh, research. Uh, so, uh, go into status on environmental status in port cities in Malaysia. So, I will just uh, give uh, some uh, insight for you to know that in Malaysia, we have uh, uh, 65 air quality monitoring station that monitored by uh, Department of Environment Malaysia. Right? Department of uh, they, uh, whereby uh, some of the station here, okay, they're on the, the bottom right, there's a map of the uh, the the stations in Malaysia we have for example the station that close to port cities uh, in Pulau Pinang eh? Pulau Pinang we have uh, uh, Perai we have Pulau Pinang itself we also have in Manjong we also have Kelang and also uh, Melaka uh, and Johor Bahru uh, in Pasir Gudang we also have on the east coast we have Kuantan and also Kemaman and on the at the east coast uh, west coast of Malaysia. Oh, sorry, the East West uh, Malaysia, we have Kuching, also we have a Bintulu and other situation. But I'm not going to present everything, every single uh, result, but just to give uh, the current situation. So the, today I will present only one station, the study area in uh, the, the data from Klang Station, Lango, whereby the Klang Station uh, situated, located at the Klinik Kesihatan. Klinik Kesihatan is here. If you see, uh, just uh, not far from uh, from the coastal environment and uh, close to the uh, Pelabuhan uh, uh, Klang. So for your information, to compare uh, uh, all the ports uh, currently still uh, uh, following or uh, need to refer to the Malaysian Air Quality Standard if we want to compare, uh, yeah, even though you have a uh, Still, uh, I have an IMO regulation, but for the all the ports in Malaysia, uh, need to follow the Malaysian Air Quality Standard. So these are the Malaysian Air Quality Standard, and we also uh, Malaysian Air Quality Standard also uh, referring or try to uh, adapt with the World Health Organization standard. These are the two most important. So the WHO, okay, if we see that the WHO Air Quality Guideline. The latest one was uh, given by the WHO in 2021. Very, very latest, whereby if we can compare the Malaysian standard of PM particulate matter, PM 2.5, uh, 15, 50, 50, 50 for the 24 hours average, but WHO standard suggests us to, to lower the concentration down to 15. And 
uh, surprisingly for the internet uh, for the annual PM 2.5 from 25 down to only five microgram per meter cubic. It is very 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 low. Uh, 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 suggested by WHO compared to the Malaysian standard. And also we have also over there EU standard and US EPA standard. But for the for the uh, in in the port, if we have a air quality monitoring or a reporting, we need to compare with the Malaysian air quality standard. Okay. So, uh, for example, the scenario that we, we, we presented here is we compile all the data from the year 2017 until 2021. So, it's a four years data. We compile, we manage all the station. Uh, we use a, a programming uh, for sure digital data. And we manage to get the, the class Lango. For example, the concentration, the mean concentration is 41, the highest. It showed that in, in, uh, uh, in 2019, for example, the highest concentration mean was uh, indicated at Klang Lango and the maximum value with the maximum value of three, 370, which above the, uh, the concentration uh, allowed by the Malaysian uh, government. And followed by Pengerang and also uh, Sebram Pride also showing quite high, especially when we see the looking into the maximum values. And this is 2019 before COVID. We also have the scenario on the air quality 2020. Uh, the clung as well still remain the highest, the highest, uh, but lower with uh, compared to 2019. Okay, but the maximum value also still, still very, 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 very high. And Pengerang Johor and also Sebrang Pride also showing quite uh, high a level of pollutant. Apart from that, not to forget the uh, uh, cities like uh, Shah Alam, eh? uh, Shah Alam, we also have a quite a uh, high level of uh, pollutant uh, indicated. So uh, to give you like this, so many big, uh, numbers. So to show uh, more uh, uh, easy for you to understand about 2019-2020 data, for example, these are the concentration. Okay, as we can see for the year 2019. Uh, these are the PM, uh, what called PM10 concentration in Klang. As we can see, a lot of uh, most of the concentration are above the WHO standard that time. Hmm? Above. And, and then in the 2020 data, we can see uh, not, that, not, not that bad because uh, if we see the, the, the concentration trend are, are better. And uh, these are, we plot all the big data. So this is like a big data analysis for the, uh, the, the centralized air quality, Malaysian air quality uh, monitoring data. So we can see the clung is the highest uh, co uh, uh, mean concentration. Okay, maybe you can uh, have a quick on this. And this also for the particular PM 2.5. The PM 2.5 is more stringent, more need to be focused because uh, the more smaller the size of the particle is more in impact to the human health. So how we do this? We do this by using the, we call my MOS, the one that we already uh, uh, copyright, have a copyright and we won the ITEC gold during uh, that time and also several uh, medals and we has also uh, uh, being uh, awarded. So these are the system. I'm not going to talk about the objective, but these are the system that we have and we manage to uh, to 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 what I call uh, manage to do when we uh, do a data big data analysis. So with this system, uh, we are able to okay from the measurement from the monitoring. If later, for example, the clown port or whatever uh, whatever port in Malaysia have. Uh, air quality monitoring station, not only air quality, but also water, water data, or whatever data, we can use this uh, this technique, this working system, we say that to, to analyze the data and finally applicable to any kind of data. We use R Studio. R is a software that very, very what call robust and can do a lot of things on the analysis. So these are the, uh, the algorithm, artificial intelligence. We use an artificial intelligence uh, that be able to do a lot of things which, which uh, it have a competitive, uh, high robust, stochasticity and also sequential, sequential model fitting. Not only for air pollution, 
uh, I have we have a partner from Turkey. They are also using the artificial intelligence uh, using R for the energy analysis, optimization, and many more. So uh, just to give insight, uh, for example, what happened during the COVID and non-COVID, we can see, for example, the PM10, PM2.5 concentration, the reduction, okay? So the, the reduction, the, the difference of between 2019 and 2020 is about 34%, and it says that the reduction is uh, supposed to be negative, right? And uh, on, the, on this side, there's a relative variable influence. Also, it shows that during 2019, the, 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 pol, the most, the most, most uh, variable influence to PM10 is carbon monoxide, and also carbon monoxide still remain the, the most uh, influential uh, parameter uh, to PM2.5 in 2020, right? So these are one of the, one or two of the paper that we publish. And maybe we also already come up with the recommendation and conclusion and how airport reduce the, the pollution level. So first, uh, we need the air quality monitoring system that uh, have a, uh, monitoring the as a whole. So we maybe uh, need to plan, have a plan, a proper plan, and need to look into the current technology. You know, the, even though if we go to the market nowadays over the outside, a lot of uh, dealer, for example, promoting their instrument. But uh, for, for my uh, opinion, because we are, I am the embodied uh, professional technologies in instrumentation, so we would like to suggest, especially for the port authority, to really choose the the most uh, good uh, instrument, robust and uh, what call a reliable. Not only uh, the, the instrument can do so many things, can measure at one time, but uh, what call the instrument must be certified. Uh, certified, for example, by the US EPA or the, from the EU, or maybe later you have the, the port authority also have uh, like a, bad, a good practice or uh, standard SOP for environmental monitoring. That for Malaysia, for example, we, maybe we can uh, look into that. For the air quality monitoring, actually, it's not just on the, the instrument. For the air quality monitoring, like a BANG 1020, or we have green technology, we also have PSI. Uh, the most popular in the United Kingdom for the air quality monitoring was uh, the TSI. Even though if we go to the, the current conference that I went in the Athens uh, last year, uh, what is that? Uh, the IAC, uh, International Aerosol Conference, the main, uh, the biggest uh, sponsor for that event is TSI. So I would like uh, not, uh, not, uh, not, not, I'm not the dealer or something for them. But from my PhD study, I also, we, the University of Leeds and most of the, the UK, so, you know, the, the, the United Kingdom, air quality monitoring use the TSI, or, okay, uh, TSI. And plus, yeah, plus uh, we also need to monitor uh, the meteorological parameters such as the wind speed, wind direction, airflow, uh, or anything related to the, meteorological that needed by the port authority. Uh, talking about this also, we I would like to suggest to the uh, authority to look into, for example, the the, car, the, the, the previous or the, the most popular now in Malaysia, the government still using the, what we call a mechanical uh, wind vane, for example, you know, the, the round, I'm not, the put, suppose I put the picture, you know, the wind vane, the round wind vane, that is the, a quite uh, what call a uh, traditional way to measure the the wind speed and wind direction. Whereby now I would like to propose and suggest to a port authority to use more a uh, modern, more sophisticated what what we call the name is a sonic anemometer. Sonic. Uh, I use this sonic anemometer during my study. Uh, how many years back in the UK, and they have a lot of a uh, sonic uh, anemometer use that will give you not only the wind speed, wind, uh, wind speed and wind direction, but also the updraft, downdraft, and many more uh, angle that uh, give a more uh, uh, accurate and uh, appropriate uh, data that needed for the 
current situation now. And second is also uh, aligned with the captain presentation, digitalization, port operation. So port are becoming more digitalized to cope with increased activity, environmental monitoring. Uh, for example, port are adapting smart port strategy, which allow them to be greener port. Uh, I also aware that in this region, South Asia, uh, this also the digitalized port operation are also like uh, something very, very new. I heard that maybe uh, some of the country like Singapore uh, have uh, some proposal on this. Um, for, for Malaysia, maybe we can hear from the uh, government Malaysia on this uh, digitalization uh, operation, either maybe fully digitalization or maybe what are the strategy uh, towards that for the Malaysia. And third, a smart port strategy also include an environmental monitoring as a whole that I mentioned for air, water, air, air, air water, and noise. Okay. And how I should reduce uh, green vessel yeah, that uh, already uh, explained also by Captain and also uh, environmental regulation. Not to, uh, not not to. We, we cannot uh, say that uh, environment uh, the regulation something that very very and uh, very uh, not, not very important. But for to control, that's the way. That's the only the way that important thing that need to be addressed need to be followed by uh, by regulating all the things that need to, to be uh, implemented. So I think Prof, uh, also uh, Captain also uh, just now has already listed down what are the regulations need to be, uh, uh, I mean, need to follow and what's, what's uh, also in the next few years uh, ahead that maybe uh, need to comply by our government. So the international maritime, for example, they, they were just updating the one that uh, we mentioned International Convention on the Prevention of Pollution from Ships stating from January 1st, heavy fuel used in vessel would not permitted to have more than 0.5% content. So this is known as the global sulfur cap to reduce sulfur dioxide and particulate matter emission. Uh, maybe this one just for uh, just a pop uh, presentation. Uh, maybe later in the future, we can arrange for another session uh, either uh, by MIMA or by the Clean Air Society Forum of Malaysia, we can collaborate uh, to this further. And finally, not to forget, save the day, and you all are you are welcome to save your day. We will host the Clean Air Society Forum of Malaysia, uh, proudly, uh, proudly to host the first Malaysian Clean Air National Forum this year uh, in May. Okay, uh, please be aware and be update on this. And the uh, the biggest one at the end of the year. The 16 IUPA Regional Conference is the one that, since we are the board member of the World Clean Air Congress or IUPA, we will be hosting the, the regional yeah, the regional conference, Sustainable Air Quality Management and Climate Change, a resilient recovery after COVID-19 in uh, Marriott Hotel, Putrajaya from the 15 to 19. October 2020. So please save your day. And the net, we also have a micro training series on the R introduction to R uh, for the beginners. Uh, not only for beginners, we have a series for the professional, for the people from maybe from MIMA, from the port authority, uh, and many more. Uh, can we can customize the, the 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 training that will guide uh, the, the 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 participant on how to manage to. Uh, to conduct or to, or to analyze the big data. And finally, not to forget, uh, next year we also will host the Asian Aerosol Conference in 2024. This is under AARA, Asia Aerosol Association. For the eighth year, we managed to win the bidding to uh, host this event. And all this, we are also looking forward uh, to welcome all of you from the from the speakers, uh, MIMA, and also the uh, uh, participants to join this event and please kindly contact us with uh, uh, the email or maybe later you can go to our website uh, or website or Facebook uh, to get more further information. I think that's it from me. Uh, I can, uh, thank you very much. Yep. Mm. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yeah, Zaitun. Uh, it's an interesting presentation on uh, I need to stop. linking the, mm. yeah linking the uh, port operations and um, the air quality surrounding it and how it can help the local community uh, in improving the air quality. Uh, 
Um, nevertheless, uh, the subject of uh, um, adaptation uh, is, is a slightly a different uh, topic, but we have been talking about air quality and how this uh, big data can be used uh, to look into improving environmental air quality and local air quality. Okay, let's, let's look into uh, the next presentation uh, from uh, Dr. Hiroshi uh, Takagi uh, from Department of uh, Transdisciplinary Science and Engineering, School of Environment and Society, uh, Tokyo Institute of Technology. Um, he has been involved in many coastal uh, disaster mitigation projects uh, for more than uh, 20 years as a researcher, uh, engineer, and officer through his work experience in two universities, uh, Tokyo Tech and Yokohama National University. Um, a, um, a port uh, construction company as well, Penta Ocean, and international uh, organizations such as uh, JICA. His uh, present research interest is to assess the vulnerability of coastal area to storm surge, tsunamis, and other climate, climatic and environmental impacts, and come up with feasible uh, countermeasures, including a hybrid, sol a hybrid solution between uh, hard structures and coastal ecosystems such as uh, mangroves. So this is uh, very relevant to the impacts of uh, adaptation and uh, uh, climate change that we are talking about the, the topic today. Uh, he is currently serves as the associate uh, editor in chief um, of Coastal Engineering Journal, which has a high impact factor for Taylor and Francis. And he edited uh, two handbooks of uh, coastal disaster and climate change. Uh, really interesting. Maybe I'll get hold of the book later and, and read it. Um, and then um, he's uh, also published by any journals in Elsevier. Uh, in uh, 2014 and 15. He is the recipient of several uh, notable awards, including 2017 um, Max Nistat Award for Outstanding Young to Mind Career research, Researcher in uh, All Science Fields, of uh, which he is the only recipient to date in the field of disaster mitigation. Well, that's impressive. Uh, he has published uh, more than 200 journal articles uh, and a uh, book chapters and found the uh, a URL uh, for the university uh, repository. So uh, impressive uh, CV, uh, Dr. Hiroshi. I think uh, as a researcher, you have a lot of things to share with us on uh, impacts of climate change and mitigation. Uh, over to you. Okay. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. So for your uh, very nice introduction and uh, also good morning, everybody. So. May I first to share my slides? Okay, you can see that. Can you share my slide? Yes. Okay, uh, anyway, uh, once again, uh, my name is uh, Hiroshi Takagi. Uh, I'm a researcher at the uh, uh, Tokyo Institute of Technologies. Uh, today, I am really honored to be invited here uh, this wonderful uh, workshops. So uh, I actually would like to talk today uh, with this title, uh, Stability of Port Breakwaters and uh, Under Climate Change. So uh, this was my uh, research topic about uh, almost 10 years ago. And uh, I am a bit concerned that uh, this topic is a little bit too engineering and also too research oriented. Uh, compared to the uh, previous uh, uh, presenters, so they so overviews very broad uh, scope, but my talk topic is a little bit too specific. But still, I believe that uh, this content is uh, still in line with uh, today's workshops. So my talk today is basically based on my uh, previous uh, research. So uh, particularly uh, those two papers and the book chapters. So uh, if, uh, and by the way, if you are interested in my talk today and uh, uh, would like to read uh, this article and paper, so please contact me at this email address. So later on, I can share uh, these papers uh, with you. So anyway, uh, I will talk the uh, stability of uh, port breakwaters, so under the climate change. So uh, broadly speaking, so there are uh, two types of uh, breakwaters. So 
Uh, one is the uh, love man breakwaters, uh, which consist of large stones or uh, blocks. So uh, this type of uh, breakwater is uh, uh, the most common uh, breakwaters worldwide. And I guess uh, Malaysia is also the case. So uh, to form a stable mound, so the cross section of this breakwater has generally a trapezoidal shape in this way. So uh, this requires a large uh, amount of stone. So especially uh, where uh, this breakwater is uh, installed in the very deep water. However, so this type of uh, breakwater is not very common in Japan. So because uh, large stones are not easily obtained. Uh, alternatively, uh, the other type of breakwaters are uh, called uh, caisson uh, breakwaters, uh, more often selected in Japan. So as uh, this figure illustrates, the structure of the caisson breakwater is much more complicated and uh, also uh, very expensive uh, to build the entire structures. Uh, on the other hand, uh, in general, so it is more stable uh, than uh, rubber mound breakwaters. So because a part of the box, so-called uh, caisson, uh, can withstand against large waves by its massive weight. So uh, given the common use in Japan, so I'm focusing on uh, caisson breakwaters uh, in this my presentations. Uh, because of the their extremely heavy weight, uh, breakwaters do not move under normal sea conditions. However, uh, in Japan, uh, high waves, uh, sometimes over 10 meters, uh, can occur uh, during the typhoons in the summer season or uh, seasonal storms in the winter season. And uh, breakwaters are sometimes damaged. Uh, due to uh, these unusual uh, events. Uh, regarding the failure modes of caisson breakwater, a sliding uh, failure pattern is the most typical uh, failure pattern. So just in this way. Uh, not only a uh, sliding uh, failure, but also the other patterns such as a tilting failure or overturning failures. So may also happen uh, therefore, the actual damage of uh, breakwaters is very complex uh, with three-dimensional motions. However, uh, if only the horizontal movement is considered, the sliding uh, motion of the caisson can be calculated in a relatively simple manner. So by solving the equation of motion written here. So uh, the accuracy of this representation was validated uh, by conducting a laboratory experiment by ourselves. Uh, this uh, slide shows that uh, a little bit complicated, but a uh, flow chart uh, which uh, estimate the sliding distance of case on breakwaters. So uh, using the previous equation and uh, many other equations. So uh, this uh, method has also incorporated some factors of climate change uh, influences uh, in addition to the uh, usual record design conditions. Uh, since the, this procedure is a little bit too complicated, so I will not go into further detail. Uh, but I, one thing I should emphasize is that the uh, uh, sliding distance can be calculated on, uh, based on the Monte Carlo simulation, so which is one of the uh, probabilistic methods. So another important procedure uh, is a uh, uh, classification of wave conditions, breaking wave or non-breaking waves. So because uh, impact of breaking waves, so it's generally uh, much larger than that of the non-breaking waves. So uh, because ocean uh, wave conditions are highly fluctuating and uh, in addition, uh, the effects of future uh, climate change are also very uncertain. So 
the assessment uh, should be probabilistic rather than deterministic. So uh, this slide shows an example of scatter of the sliding distance of a case of breakwaters calculated by this probabilistic model. In this simulation, a variable related to the waves and the tides were generated uh, for 5,000 different conditions using random numbers. So although the sliding distance vary with each trial, uh, the average or uh, expect, expected sliding distance was uh, five centimeters uh, in the present climate conditions, uh, whereas uh, this will increase up to the 18 centimeters in the future climate. So as explained more detail later, uh, this next graph shows the uh, uh, water depth and the wave conditions have a significant effect on the sliding distance. The horizontal uh, axis uh, indicates the uh, water depth of the breakwaters, uh, while the vertical axis uh, indicates the uh, sliding distance of the breakwaters. Uh, there are two characteristic trends, uh, phase one and phase two. So in phase one, uh, the sliding distance uh, increases uh, because wave force and the buoyancy force both increase. So as the water depths become deeper. So however, uh, at the certain water depths uh, for this particular case around the 60 meters. So the trend changed to the phase two. So uh, this implies that the chance of breaking waves uh, is uh, becoming smaller, uh, resulting in lower wave forces and a shorter sliding distance. Now, uh, I would like to explain a case study uh, in which the proposed model was applied to an actual port in Japan, uh, Shibushi port. The Shibushi port is located in the southern part of the Kyushu, <coughs> Kyushu Island, and uh, uh, is subject to uh, very high waves. So particularly during the typhoon season, the uh, total extension of uh, breakwaters is about 2,600 meters. And the breakwater can be divided into the uh, eight different sections according to the uh, structural dimension, water depth, and so on. The accuracy of the uh, probabilistic model was verified by comparing with actual case of breakwater failures. <clears throat> Let me explain the past two uh, typhoons uh, which severely uh, damaged Shibushi port. First typhoon number 16 in 2004. So uh, this typhoon generated large waves and caused uh, sliding of many caissons. The damaged caissons were, however, mostly repairable. So uh, they were placed back on the same locations. However, uh, it was very unfortunate that uh, in the next year, 2005, so another strong typhoon, typhoon uh, number 40, hit the same port again, and the horse uh, caused a severe sliding failure uh, to the same port uh, and the breakwaters. After uh, these typhoons, a uh, precise survey uh, was carried out by the Port Authority uh, in order to investigate extent of the uh, failures. The black uh, dot uh, in these uh, figures indicates a one unit of the caisson systems. And the horizontal axis indicator, uh, indicator how far uh, each caisson had a slide by the typhoon in 2004, left panel, and in 2005, right panel. So all these caissons in this slide have almost same dimension and the same water depth. Uh, however, all caissons moved quite randomly. So uh, this fact implies that a precise prediction of uh, sliding of each caisson is almost impossible. Uh, because randomness is uh, too large. Uh, therefore, a uh, probabilistic way, uh, such as a uh, uh, Monte Carlo simulation uh, adopted in our model can become powerful too. 
So uh, this uh, vertical red line shows the uh, uh, average uh, value of sliding distance uh, calculated by our probabilistic model, while uh, blue lines show the maximum values. Uh, so for example, uh, regarding the typhoon uh, in 2004, the maximum value of, by observation was 2.84 meters, uh, while 3.13 uh, meter by our calculation, uh, the average value was 0 0.54 meters by observation, while 0 0.39 meter by calculation. So a uh, similar comparison between observation and the calculation uh, can be seen in the 2005 uh, typhoon's case. So uh, actually, uh, actual sliding distance of the breakwater is quite uh, scattering. So, however, the estimated distance uh, seems to be uh, statistically acceptable, predictable. So with an error of less than 50%, of the major distance. One uh, significant uh, change that may be caused by uh, climate change in the future uh, is an increase in wind speed due to tropical cyclones. So uh, this projection appears to be very difficult because uh, generation of a tropical cyclone system itself is uh, highly uncertain. Uh, in our case study, so we just simply assume uh, the future climate change will cause a 10% increase in wind speed uh, during a tropical cyclone. So just recently, the NOAA teams uh, that projected that TC, a tropical cyclone, wind speeds uh, could increase by up to 2% at two degree uh, warming scenarios. Uh, so uh, this uh, projection uh, is consistent with the uh, uh, scenario uh, we assumed 10 years ago. For the wave uh, simulation calculation, uh, we used a wave uh, simulation model uh, called the SWAN model uh, developed by the Delft in the Netherlands. So the calculations were efficiently performed by connecting that the uh, Region one, so which indicate includes that entire Japan's uh, region two, which focus on the southern Kyushu, and the region three, so which is the area uh, just around the Shibu port. In this slide, the upper figure shows that uh, how a uh, storm induced waves respond to the change in wind speed by taking the typhoon number sixty in two thousand four as a case study typhoon. So uh, even though uh, the wind speed uh, increased just uh, by 10%, the wave height appeared to increase uh, more than 10%. So we performed that simulation for a total of 10 typhoons and uh, calculate uh, intensification of the wave height and found a 21% increase in the wave height on average. So, uh, theoretically speaking, so this is not surprising uh, because the uh, wind uh, drag force between the air and the sea surface is proportional to the square of the wind speed. Then uh, we assumed uh, four climate scenarios as shown in this table, uh, try to predict how a typhoon will be uh, impacting breakwaters in the future. Uh, scenario A is a base scenario, uh, which does not consider climate change. So that is present climate. Scenario B uh, consider the future uh, wave, uh, but sea level rise uh, remains unchanged. Scenario C uh, consider the sea level rise, uh, but the wave remains unchanged. Uh, scenario D uh, consider the both uh, future waves and the uh, sea level rise. So uh, scenario, scenario D is the expected future climate condition. This slide shows that the summary of simulation uh, which predicted the increase of sliding distance uh, of case and breakout uh, at the ship port. Uh, the simulations were performed uh, for uh, six 
uh, sections with different dimension and different water depths. The white uh, thrust bars show the uh, estimated sliding distance for scenario A, the uh, red bars for scenario B, the green thrust bars for scenario C, and the blue bars for the scenario uh, D. So for uh, all uh, six uh, sections, sliding distance will be increasing. So as climate change uh, progresses. So also uh, please note that the a combination of sea level rise and the uh, wave increase will further increase the sliding distance of a caisson. Uh, for example, in the case of section two, the sliding distance was only five centimeters for scenario A, present condition, present condition while it was uh, nearly 10 centimeters for both the cases of scenario B and scenario C. However, it jumped to the uh, up to the 18 centimeters for the scenario D. So in this way, overall, the sliding distance of breakwaters uh, can increase up to three times to uh, up to three to five times as a result of combined effect of sea level rise and the wave uh, height increase. Finally, uh, I would like to quickly talk the result of a brief uh, study on how to stabilize breakwater against climate change. For, ex for instance, the crest elevation of the Shibushi breakwater uh, is plus seven meters above the uh, water level. Uh, probably the easiest uh, adaptation measure is just to raise uh, this superstructure part as illustrated. This uh, final figure shows that uh, raising the uh, height of the breakwater uh, reduces the, the sliding distance. Uh, according to our prediction, the sliding distance under climate change is uh, 80, 18 centimeters. Uh, in order to reduce the sliding distance to the present level, so which is just uh, five centimeters, so the breakwater would need to be raised 1.522 meter. So, for example, uh, the IPCC uh, scenario. Uh, projected the sea level rise of 20 to 60 centimeter uh, by the middle of by the middle to the end of this century. So uh, the elevation of breakwater need to be uh, redesigned to 2.5 to uh, 10 times uh, higher than the pace of sea level rise. So uh, finally, uh, I would like to uh, summarize uh, today's my talk uh, in three in these three points. Okay, uh, that's my talk. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hiroshi. Um, we, it was an interesting presentation from an engineering perspective. Um, how we can use uh, breakwater. Um, of course, it's very important for safe uh, uh, docking and so on in the ports, but uh, climate change is actually causing um, uh, structural integrity of the breakwaters uh, to be compromised. So it's interesting to see how uh, sea level rise, uh, uh, how to mitigate by increasing the, the height of the uh, caissons. Very interesting uh, presentation, um, very specific to the port. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, let's uh, move into the next uh, presenter. Um, unfortunately, he couldn't join the Zoom uh, call uh, directly. So we would ask uh, the organizers to play the video that he has uh, recorded for us instead. Um, and uh, let me introduce uh, uh, Prof. Miguel. Um, he is a um, uh, professor uh, in uh, a Faculty of Civil Engineering. Civil and Environmental Engineering in Research Institute uh, of Sustainable Future Society uh, in uh, Wasida University at the moment. And um, he received his PhD in uh, Coastal Engineering from uh, Yokohama National University in 2007. And he continued his uh, postdoctoral fellowship in United Nations University Institute Advanced Studies. Uh, 
and uh, Kyoto University. Subsequently, he worked uh, in as associate professor at the University of Tokyo. I think it's uh, maybe uh, Dr. Hiroshi knows him very well. Um, he has authored uh, over 135 uh, journal papers on a variety of uh, subjects. Uh, Professor Miguel uh, also um, research deals with um, the effect of natural disasters uh, will have on various components of socio-economic makeup of different countries. In this respect, he's involved in estimation of different destruction components of various types of disasters originate from sea, namely cyclone and uh, tsunamis. Understanding how these events can devastate coastal areas and cause a loss of many lives is important to formulate strategies. Furthermore, his research deals on the effect of climate change uh, will have on natural disasters, particularly tropical cyclones, which are expected to increase in intensity uh, and frequency in the future. This is a very opt uh, topic uh, and his experience is relevant. This um, coupled with sea level rise, of course, is going to make it uh, bad and uh, his research um, attempts to quantify the economic damage uh, this can cause to the transport infrastructure and agriculture so that's very interesting to see the economic damage to the assets as well as the revenue to the uh, country uh, and the companies operating in these ports right okay let's uh, listen to the video and then uh, we can uh, see how we can deal with the uh, question and answer after this excuse video. me I just found that the Miguel just arrived. So, ah, okay. so maybe you can pass that mic to him. Fantastic. So um, Dr. Miguel, uh, can you yeah turn on your audio? Yes, uh, apologies for all that. I seems my computer was doing very strange things. Um, um, apologies. Um, anyway, uh, I will quickly try to um, share my screen. Thanks, thanks uh, Takagi. Okay, can you can everybody see my screen? Yes, we can see that. Good. Okay. Yeah, good to go. Today I want to talk to you about uh, actual adaptation to sea level rise in ports and uh, learning from real case studies of uh, areas. Um, sorry, Dr. Miguel. Um maybe you can change your display settings to to show both screens. Uh, so, yeah, you go to the top and uh, display settings on the top uh, left. Corner. Yeah. And then it's... Yeah, duplicate. Uh, maybe. Yeah, just click the duplicate slideshow. It doesn't want to do that. Okay. Why doesn't it want to do this? You have two screens, I believe. Okay, let me try again. Yeah, maybe you can disconnect one of your screen. Yeah. Uh, then, then it'll work. Um, is that better now? Yes, yes. You can go into the PowerPoint mode. Okay. Yes. Is that now? Yeah, we're good. Okay, good. So, yeah, I want to talk about actual adaptation to sea level rise and ports and learning from real case studies of cities around the planet. Um, so, first of all, I acknowledge that this is the work uh, done by a large team of people, including uh, Takagi, uh, Hiroshi Takagi, who was one of your previous speakers. Um, what we do in this research is to try to understand through um, how looking at cases of land subsidy, subsidence around the planet to understand how sea level rise adaptation will actually work in the future. And we do this in cities, um, in ports, in areas um, with essentially outside of sea dikes. And I'm going to be talking later about Jakarta, the case of Tohoku in Japan. We also study small islands, such as the Philippines. Um, so, um, first of all, I want to talk to you about sea level rise adaptation in um, areas which are subsiding, and I'm going to be talking about the case of Jakarta, uh, which is a city which by now subsided by over five meters. So as a consequence of groundwater extraction, currently Jakarta is sinking by about 10 to 20 centimeters per year. 
and this is something that is happened in other places around the planet. So this is this uh, graph is actually from Takagi, the previous speaker, and it shows how the because of um, various problems often related to ground subsidence, many cities in Asia are actually um, subsiding. So we have Jakarta, and here you can see the or case study area in northern Jakarta. It's a, uh, one of the ports. Um, and it's by now, because of this land subsidence, the port is between almost like three or meters below sea level. In 2007, this is what the area looked like. So you had this small concrete wall protecting it from being flooded. And um, you see uh, how the, because of like a, a mutual tide event, then the wall was overtopped. And this is a more recent, um, more recently what it looks like. And what they've done is reinforced the concrete wall. And actually now they're building a new dike further out into the sea. So all with this protecting this area from getting flooded is this little wall at the moment. Well, now a bigger dike on the outside. This also happened in Tokyo. So in Tokyo, uh, there was about four meters of land subsidence during the 20th century. And even as a consequence of uh, typhoons, there was flooding in 1917. So this is even before the land subsidence started. But nowadays, because of this ground subsidence, what happens is there are dikes which are protecting the area from getting flooded. And this would be the height of the water if, sorry, this is indicating the height of the present dike and what would be the height of the water if that dike didn't exist and the storm surges that happened. So essentially, you see here the high water level is actually at the second floor of a house. And here you can see these uh, dikes, which, well, in this case, are levees, which are protecting this area, Koto Ward, from being flooded. And what we did is try to understand um, the adaptation sequence, how Tokyo and Jakarta are similar, and even other places like Miami. So in the case of Tokyo, you see here on the left side, a small concrete wall that was built in 1949 um, to protect the area from being flooded. You see that Jakarta has a similar dike, and then you see that Miami is starting to build one. The second stage is actually starting to build pumps to remove the excess water. On the left, you see a Dogawa ward in Tokyo. In the center, you see Jakarta, and Miami is also starting to build pumps. Next stage is reinforcing levees and construction and the construction of storm surge gates. And here you can see some stores, um, storm surge gates in Koto Ward in Tokyo. And you can see improvements to the levees in, uh, system in Jakarta. Fourth stage then becomes the land reclamation and conservation projects. So in Tokyo, there are many islands, Odaiba, Haneda Airport, where I just arrived this morning, where coastal areas have been reclaimed from the sea. And in Jakarta, several islands have been reclaimed to make room also for exp expensive apartment blocks, such as those in Pelangi Island on the right. There's also talk of this great Garuda project. The final stage would be the construction of super levees and elevating entire districts. So Tokyo's actually started working on these super levees, which means entire areas of the city get demolished and then rebuilt to a higher ele elevation. In Jakarta, this hasn't happened yet, but I'm sure it will happen in the future. So we did some work and to try to estimate how much all this would cost, how much essentially building the levees would cost. But this is about, um, I guess this presentation is mostly about ports. So I'm going to um, go over this quickly and not uh, really, uh, but anyway, it would be this, my, the point I'm trying to make with all this is that it's actually very expensive. It can be done to elevate areas, but it is an incredibly expensive endeavor. Now, what can we learn from Tohoku? In Tohoku, after the 2011 earthquake and tsunami, the land subsided by about a meter, meter and a half, depending on the area. And here you can see one port area. So what happens as a consequence of this land subsidence is now the port area was, is flooded at high tides and what was done as a result. So the damage is because of the tsunami, of course. But what was done, and here you can see a, a photo of one of my former students, is gravel was poured on top of the port and then it was resurfaced. And then here you can see a different port area in another town. And again, but again, the same thing. 
it's flooded at high tide as water is seeping into the port. But what they've done is they've thrown some gravel on top and resurfaced. Even more substantial adaptation is happening for in for the case of um, trying to protect the area against future tsunamis. So here you can see how entire towns have been elevated by up to 15 meters. So it is possible and to make huge investments and elevate towns. And here you can see these conveyor belts that were um, put in place to um, uh, move all the uh, material from the mountains to um, adjacent lands. Again, another example, here is the case of Kirikiri. And what you can see here in the distance is how a new dike is being built. And yet the old town, you can see the town here. But what you see is actually the town now has been elevated. All you see actually is a green area, but originally the town was at the lower end of that uh, slope as per the, like the cross section that you're seeing on at the bottom of the slide. So there's new dike and then the town is elevated by 10 meters. So what can we learn about adapting um, in Jakarta, adapting to port subsidence outside of dikes? So in the case of Jakarta, as I said before, the land has gone down by about five meters. So how can a port adapt to the equivalent? Essentially, what would happen if the sea level went up by five meters? So we can see um, this port, Sunda Kelapa port. At the time when we went to sea, um, all what was protecting the port from being flooded is this little curb here. So if that curb didn't exist when at high level, then the uh, ground beneath it be, uh, sorry, behind it would be flooded. And you can see how this was being elevated at different times. So if I play one more time, well, in front you can see actually a residential area which is being protected by a new dike. But here you can see this little concrete curb has two stages, the original stage and then a newer later um, stage of like a, uh, where they elevated it further. And you can see how this is inconvenience it poses an inconvenience to the ships because obviously they have to, it's difficult for them to afloat. And here you can see some of the students of uh, Takagi, actually. So I think Takagi can just about be seen in the photo in the video just behind them. Um, anyway, how are they adapting? Well, this is one of the oldest ports, in, the oldest port in Jakarta, and it's suffering 10, 7 to 10 centimeters of land subsidence per year. They're spending 20% of their annual income, income on adaptation. And what they do is they adapt section by section. So what they do in the top section, you see a, a, sec, a part of the port, which all they're doing is just building this little curb. And the one on, at the bottom, you can see how uh, this little curve has then been backfilled with materials and elevated. So they're doing this sequentially in different parts of the port as they have money. Um, the technology that they're using is, in some cases, they, um, they're using piles um, at the water side, and they put uh, soil on top and re-concreted it. They've, the port authorities tell us that this costs them about 100 US dollars per meter, um, per meter squared for the ground rising, and the piling is about 4,000 US dollars per meter run. Um, here you can see one of the sections of the port that was elevated recently. So this is the container part. You see it looks quite new. But interesting, of, interestingly, of course, you see that even though they've elevated it, the parts that, where they haven't elevated behind the section. Uh, let's see if I can play again. Are still getting water infiltration. So this is a problem when you start to get areas of ports which are elevated. If you don't elevate behind them, then water will seep through. And the port believes that there is no limit to how far they can go by using the present technology. Here in the table below, you can see for different sea level rise, which they've suffered already and as relative land subsidence, they say that there's no technology limits. They can continue doing this forever. No cost benefit limits. They need to do this. Financial barriers, they say, well, ultimately the government will pay, of course. Um, and they say there's no social, social conflicts because actually the fishermen want them to, and all the port users want them to continue to elevate the port. Um, eventually they say it might be difficult 
for the water to drain to the sea. And this, they think, should be solved by having pumps. A different port, this is Nisam Sahman port. Here you can see that these mangrove, uh, mangroves were planted um, in an area that would have otherwise been land a long time ago. Notice how they're building a new um, port out. And this is the pathway that they use. I'll play it again. The pathway that they use to access the boats is this little pathway. And as I said, the area where the mangroves are would have one time been on top of the water. And then now they're building a dike further out to keep the water out of the port. And interestingly, here you can see um, how the port is still in use. And here you can see again that this port goes through different ad adaptation stages. It was founded in 1984. It suffers again 7 to 12 centimeters of subsidence per year, and it's been raised multiple times. The last first in 2002, then in 2012. And rising the port has been done sequentially. First one part of the port, and then the next. Funding was provided by JICA, but as you see, the bottom section is the one that where they raised all the port most recently. And the one on the top is where they've only raised this little pathway to access the ships. And then the part of the side is just being colonized by mangroves. Again, they're using sheet piles and uh, then just pouring some uh, concrete on top. They are thinking of moving to a floating port and they reckon there's no limit to how far they can use and uh, they can go using this technology. However, they think that in terms of cost benefit, it might be more efficient to move to a floating port. They say that the government will ultimately have to pay given the multiplier effects to the economy. And the communities, nearby communities, are happy that the boats have been raised. So there's no problem there. We went to yet another port, Moaranke. This is a fishing port founded in 1977, again, seven centimeters per year. And the port's been raised multiple times, 2006, 2011, 2014, about half a meter each time. And I find this is a very interesting, let me see if I can pause this. This is a very interesting snapshot of the photo. On the left side, you can see that there is water. That's the section, the original section of the port. So that's it's underwater now. Sorry, that was well underwater, raised, but even though it was raised, it's still underwater. The part in the center is the part that was raised afterwards, and the part of the right is the latest part that they've raised. Now, let me continue playing the video. So here you can see at the horizon, you can that is reclaimed land actually. So the city is going further into the sea. So new apartment blocks. Um, people are moving closer to the sea, not moving away. Again, these three sections which show you. And of course, on the one side, you can actually see some tetrapods that are now underwater because they were the original um, protection of the port, but now they're almost in the water. The port was raised using sheet piles at either side and then pouring concrete on top. Again, they are thinking of moving to a um, um, floating port. They say that it's probably they would, the port authorities here, when they when we interviewed them, they said they could probably only raise the port two, three times before they reach the limits of the shear piles. And then they're thinking of moving to floating ports. So they say cost benefit might be better just to move to the, fl to the floating ports. And they've already started to experiment with this, which is what I'm showing you here. So these are some piles and then on the piles uh, you have these um, floating plastic uh, containers or structures and again you can see to the right side let's see if I can play it again on the right side you can see the other three sections of the port that have been raised sequentially and this is what they're experimenting with if you want and they've done the piles in a way that if you see the piles here so that these this floating structure can continue to go up even as the land continues to subside, whereas the part on the right won't. Tohoku, as I said before, subsided um, about 0 0.5 to 1 meter as a consequence of land subsidence. And um, this photo here, you can see uh, Takagi, as again, uh, the previous speaker and myself, we went to visit one of these ports and how the port is compensating with this increase in um water levels as a consequence of land subsidence so it's an industrial port 
it was designed mostly with considerations regarding tsunami hazards. And the key point here is that in order to make the port earthquake um, proof, they have to drive these piles into, um, into the water. So at the edge of the um, of the port, see why is my computer doing this? Um, anyway, the key consideration then is um, these piles. They said that there is no technological limits, although redesign would be necessary to adapt the design. So new piles, if you go above an extra one meter rise. Rising ground by another half a meter would maybe be 10 times more expensive. And then if you had to do three meters or more, then it would be maybe 100 times more expensive because of these earthquake countermeasures. So they didn't conduct any cost benefit assessments. Essentially, the government would ultimately have to spend the money. However, from their point of view, from the point of view of the engineers designing the port, over four meters of raising the port over four meters would not make sense. And maybe after that point, the local residents would be happier to retreat. So essentially, they're saying that another meter would be fine, but after two meters, maybe it would not be so easy for them to continue to adapt. And we went to yet another port in the north, uh, in Kamaishi. And here, the land subsidence was uh, about one meter. And the same considerations, again, um, were dominated by tsunamis. We looked into the costs so we were asking for to do this we were asking at, we were asking the engineers responsible for each of the ports to tell us how much it was costing to do all these things and of course this is highly dependent on the port the country and um what is driving the design for the case of japan the earthquake countermeasures are driving the design and this makes it very expensive to increase the level of the port for other places if you're not don't have to do that then just pull some material and do some shit piles now what are my conclusions um many times when you hear about uh, the talk about uh, sea level rise people start to say that uh, we will migrate and we will vacate ports or move away from the sea or something we don't see any evidence of this people are not going to retreat from coastal settlements because of sea level rise and especially not Dense populated, densely populated coastal areas. And certainly, I don't think that ports are going to be moved because ports are incredibly expensive infrastructure and it's cheaper just to adapt in place rather than to move. Adaptation is sequential. So, what happens is you tend to um, adapt as and when you have money, as we saw in the case of the ports in Jakarta. Um, so, different parts of the port will adapt in sequence if you want. Both authorities did not uh, identify any barriers to adapt to a sea level rise of one meter or even two meters. And as I said, this is experience to do with ground subsidence. But when you're looking at ground subsidence, it's faster than sea level rise. So if you can adapt to ground subsidence, adapting to sea level rise shouldn't be a problem. Jakarta and Top Tokyo have, uh, have adapted to four meters. So if anything, probably will advance on the sea. However, I'm not saying that all this doesn't pose problems. No, it poses a lot of problems and it's ex incredibly expensive. And of course, it always affects disproportionately the poor. And uh, yeah, we've actually also done some documentaries to uh, show you what some of the some areas look like. So we actually have some VR headsets that can show you uh, some of the or case study areas. But of course, I cannot show this here. Anyway, that's all. And sorry for all the problems at the beginning. I apologize. It's been a bit of a hard day for me. Uh, but anyway, thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Esteban. And um, uh, it's very interesting to see uh, pictures and videos uh, with a real uh, example of uh, um, how adaptation may look like. Because um, in most of the talks, uh, um, usually we will hear concepts, theories, um, engineering drawings, and so on. So this is this is very very interesting to see this um, in in more of a, a realistic manner. Uh, of course, it's a subsidence, but the, the adaptation measures are similar uh, for sea level rise as well. 
Uh, interesting, very interesting. Thank you very much for your uh, talk. Um, luckily, you you managed to speak in in physical, <laughs> so so you can join the question and answer session. I'm very sure uh, the audience has a lot of questions in uh, in the sequence. So uh, now we are going to the question and answer session. So maybe uh, all the uh, panel uh, members uh, speakers may can can on the audio and also. Um, video yes thank you very much so let's uh, start with uh, the question and answer session maybe um i uh, have a, a few um uh, questions for each uh, of the panel member then we can uh, open up uh, to the uh, audience so maybe we can start with um, the first speaker uh, we have uh, uh, dr uh, sorry uh, uh, captain subra uh, so, so Captain Subra, I think, uh, has been talking about the experience in ports in, in Malaysia and and so on. Um, so, so just to ask um, to in in the ports, uh, you mentioned about mangroves and, and rehabilitation. I mean, rehabilitation of the mangroves. Uh, I would like to link this to the other uh, civil and engineering uh, structural integrity uh, work that has been discussed by. Uh, the other uh, professors from uh, Takagi and uh, Dr. Esteban, right? Maybe um, you can explain um, uh, whether um, you have considered uh, the uh, um, the civil and engineering or structural uh, um, um, integrity. I mean, uh, structural uh, looking into civil and engineering methods, right? Instead of the nature-based solutions uh, to look into um, protecting your uh, port area. Thank you, uh, Thiru. Yeah, excellent presentations from uh, everyone uh, and also from the engineering aspects uh, of uh, Dr. Takagi and Professor Estaban. I think it gave us a different perspective of what we need to expect in this region. I mean, in Jakarta is not too far away from where we are. Um, and probably due to the natural conditions here, we are not that exposed uh, as uh, what in some Indonesian islands are. But I think it's a matter of time. Uh, sea level rise is a real thing. And um, it, it may be a bit slower in these regions, but we have already seen uh, uh, tides that are abnormal here. Uh, and we have seen uh, king tides uh, occurring once or twice a year. And naturally, we have to take all of them into consideration. Uh, land subsidence is uh, what Professor uh, Esteban was saying. I think uh, this is a ongoing issue, I think, in many parts of the world due to groundwater extraction. And the effects will only be seen several years later. And I think this is something that uh, we have to be very careful about. Uh, but in, in, in Malaysia, uh, thankfully, we, we do not do much of groundwater extraction anymore at the moment uh, due to advance in uh, an advancement in uh, in technology of water resourcing uh, but that is not not to actually completely dis discount the fact that uh, some of the islands here are actually ha having the same effect so coming back into the port design into construction yes we have taken into consideration the uh, sea level rise uh, our engineering designs are always uh, adaptive uh, to uh, new requirements, uh, and this is an ongoing thing. Um, and we have seen uh, some changes over the years. Of course, when we first started port, port operations way back in the 1900s, uh, we started off in a terminal known as South Port. Uh, today, we, we have upgraded that place as what exactly Professor Esteban has mentioned. We have raised it several times. Uh, and, and today, you know, we're just on the marginal level of keeping the high tide just below the wharfs. But yet we still do get flooding uh, through the backflow, through the drains and so on. So this is an ongoing thing. But the new wharfs that you're constructing, uh, certainly we're taking into consideration uh, the effect of sea level rise. Uh, also the impact of winds and abnormal waves as well. Uh, we have also uh, are planning to go into more... Uh, you know, uh, more offshore port construction, you know, as, as cities get closer to the ports, the ports get displaced offshore. And therefore, when you get into deeper waters, then we are we are looking at uh, other elements such as larger waves and so on. So 
Breakwater construction is definitely going to be on the cards in our next spot construction. So all this will be taken into consideration. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Captain Captain Subra. Um, just just want to look into uh, uh, because uh, looking into uh, Dr. Takagi and uh, uh, Professor Exter and uh, your experience of um, doing a lot of research in Tokyo and Japan. The question is now to um, Dr. Nozaitun. Um, how is the Malaysian um, academics and universities are looking into the the effects of uh, subsidence? And uh, like uh, what uh, Captain Subra has mentioned, uh, there has been uh, incidents of they have been uh, rising the you know uh, engineering um, works you not know, to raise the dikes and so on, um, and also bringing the breakwaters. So have that been a detailed research like what uh, Dr. Takagi has done uh, has been done to all our ports, like collecting this kind of data and and putting in more of a um, statistical analysis using your R models and so on. Beyond, beyond your air, uh, it's more on, on air. Mm. Yeah. All right, yes. Uh, about the um, sea level, oh yes. Uh, some of the research in this, uh, in our university uh, is also, we have a, a team where looking into the climate change, climate change and also another group looking into the marine, marine matters about the ocean, all those things. So actually we have some uh, 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 research already uh, First on the trending, looking to the trending, also on in terms of the uh, controlling and uh, engineering. Uh, I think we also have some uh, uh, collaborator from the university. What the other one? Eh? University uh, DRB Highcom. Uh, he was the one that just graduated from the uh, Japan as well. Somebody similar with what the professor presented just now. And the one that already approaching us, uh, showing that these are the things that we should uh, implement to, to Malaysia to, to protect the sea seaside and whatsoever. So we have a, in Malaysia in our university, uh, so we have a team. But uh, for me to give more detail about what are the more detail, more technical, I may not be able to Some. give today. But in the future, maybe it is something interesting to together to gather all these uh, expert uh, about the climate change and, and the, the thing that we we mentioned today not only hope finish today then we can uh, may do a, a future a next uh, follow up about this to extend discuss about this but it's very very interesting uh, and uh, in our region the issues of the climate change due to the you know the the sea level uh, increasing is very very critical already in uh, corridor Pantatimo, you know, the east coast of, of Malaysia. Uh, recently, we have a very high uh, flood, uh, flood, uh, uh, what call it? Yeah, a big flood. It, because they said that the, 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 because of the sea level, increase the, the, the sea level, that one, the, 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 the water going up, and then the, the rain from the, from the land, uh, from the river, and then when it uh, go, I mean, uh, uh, to going together, then it will give a very big, uh, impact to the people so this is uh, the thing that we actually discussed i am i i went to that area affect the area and discuss with our dean of property the university that the university should should have a look into this so i think um, yes we, we will look into more serious on uh, this one uh, by gathering more expert on this area and also maybe uh, during the conference that we plan this end of the year we'll look into all these things we can uh, uh, think of it right yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zaitun. Uh, I personally have been involved in the mm -hmm. national communication reports to the UNFCCC and uh, another national hydro. Oh, another, yeah. Yeah. Have been doing a lot of uh, hydrodynamic studies. Uh -huh. and, uh, yeah, what you mentioned has been uh, highlighted in many areas, but particularly on ports, I think there need to be more research uh, oh, yeah. to be done mm -hmm. by universities. But let's move into the next uh, question. Maybe it's, it's uh, to both uh, Dr. Takagi and uh, Dr. Esteban. Uh, it's interesting you you mentioned about um, people don't uh, migrate because uh, the, the the normal um, view is uh, there will be climate refugees and people uh, in Bangladesh all those deltas people will be migrating right uh, so um, so there's a difference between um, the communities uh, the the vulnerable uh, those who are below uh, so, no, not having a low socioeconomic uh, income. Uh, 
and the difference between the, the port authorities and, and corporations and, and buildings uh, who can do reclamation and, and move into the sea, right? Can I get your view on um, what will, uh, who will be moving and who won't be moving? In, in generally, when you say people won't migrate, is the communities or uh, it is the, the, author, uh, the, the port authorities, the, the corporations won't move? Can you, can you explain a little, elaborate a little bit from your experience? Who moved and who didn't move? Like in your, in your example, you see that uh, even though they have uh, built the dikes, uh, the water is still subsiding to one of the house there. Yeah, right. So uh, yeah, maybe you can give your uh, views on who will be moving, who won't be moving. I think uh, this topic may be the more relevant to Mr. Miguel, maybe. I thought you'd know. I thought uh, I'd let you go first. You, you're the expert in Jakarta. <laughs> uh, anyway, so I, I talk that straight a different topic. So uh, my topic is a very quite a hard engineering topic. But uh, so uh, yes, uh, my talk was uh, well compensated by the Miguel's talk. So that about uh, the how to uh, local people naturally adopt to the changing climate. So that's actually a very important topic. Uh, probably uh, my, my talk was uh, quite a bit old topic. So at that time, so I still didn't uh, fully realize how the people, uh, how they can adapt to the changing climate. So uh, my talk was based on the, uh, let's say the IPCC AR4. So maybe two older generation. At that time, so in the report, so they didn't also consider anything about the subsidence. They all, always say that the sea level rise and the uh, hurricane seems like, but uh, I think that in the present AR6, so they started to talk uh, subsidence or uh, not only sea level rise. So subsidence is a relative sea level rise. So uh, then as Miguel uh, fully described, the situation. Uh, so uh, to be honest, I didn't fully realize that it was uh, progressing. So before we go to the Jakarta or uh, Manila and uh, uh, and uh, also the Vietnam. So once we came to the site and uh, observed the situation, then first realize how they can adapt it. But I, I think that the normally they adapt naturally very much. So not forced by any government or local authority, but because they have to resist, they have to adopt. So, so that's my observation. Maybe Miguel has a more in-depth observations. Okay. Miguel, so uh, you, you. on mute. Yeah. Can I share the screen? Yes, please. If I can share. Okay. Yeah, can you see this? Yes. So this is um these are some islands in the Philippines, uh, which is one of the case studies um where we've been. So I've, I've been showing you Jakarta, right? So of yes. course these islands uh, were affected by an earthquake in 2011. And because of the earthquake, the islands in an instant subsided by about a meter and a half. So these are very small islands on top of a coral bank. And 11 years later, people are still there. So they've adapted by raising the um, like the pathways through the islands. But as you can see here, most of the island gets flooded, they get flooded at high tide. So this is inside people's houses. And people still haven't moved. So of course you can say what will happen when a typhoon comes and wipes them out, but that's what happened last year. So 90% of the houses in the islands were destroyed. So that was after these videos were taken, but still people didn't move and went back and rebuilt. So, um, and this is what the islands look like from above. So neither in Jakarta, neither in these small islands, people are moving away. So this is, I, I agree that it's completely counterintuitive because everybody says uh, climate refugees, people will move, etc. But the actual fact is people do not move. So, and this is uh, the difference between talking about um, hypotheticals of what people will do and how actually human beings behave. And human beings will not move away. They will do everything they can to adapt. 
And I thought um, the comment uh, by the, um, by, I'll stop sharing now. So I thought the comment by uh, uh, Captain, I, I don't know if I'm Bra pronouncing it. Yeah. Captain Subramanian. So I thought it was very interesting. He said precisely what I think. Now the cities are moving towards the ports and the po ports are moving offshore. So it's not that we're moving inland, it's that we're moving further out. So I don't find any evidence of um, people abandoning yeah. the coastline. Interesting, very interesting. Um, yeah, I'm just reflecting uh, for, for centuries, uh, for decades, uh, Venice didn't move. <laughs> Venice still exists. <laughs> Still existing, and um, I, I've been to Venice. Uh, they are, they are it, the, the, the two tights that happen in a day. It's it's a routine. People people are wearing uh, shoes up to their more than their knees up to you know, and and uh, the, the boots. No, they are going to work, and uh, we tourists who do not know that uh, will get uh, flooded. <laughs> you know, we will we'll get stuck with this uh, flood. But you're right. I think the adaptation is is uh, happening. Um, you people are not moving, and even uh, psychologically, uh, even I'm talking about my parents. Uh, I ask them to move from their house and come and stay with me because I have a better facility and so on. Uh, they won't. They won't. <laughs> they will stick and stay in their old kampong house, and uh, they would like to be there until they are the last uh, moment of their life. So, I think um, uh, it is uh, it's acclimatized. Uh, acclimatization, I will say. I, I don't know the, the word is correct, but it's it's about um, you are trying to adopt and uh, be there. So I, I open the, the discussion here now uh, with these comments um, to the floor. Uh, is there any questions from the floor that I uh, would like to raise to the panel members, please? And Captain, you would like to add on to uh, any any of your, uh, Dr. Zaitun? to the comments from um yeah yeah Tiru, i see there's a question on from the floor uh yeah. which uh, speaks on maladaptation uh and they've asked for what would the impact be of maladaptation um are we are we really sure what we are doing uh you know adaptation is something that is ongoing we 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 don't want to get to a stage like what Professor Esteban has mentioned until until the ground is eroded and and and, and sunken uh, before we take action. So what we want to do is we want to take preventive actions, and that is something that needs to be done. And exactly what what we are doing today, so that we don't get into a situation where uh, as an afterthought, then we start doing the corrective measures. So the ports generally a little bit different from a human behavior. Human behavior, you know, they're very resilient. They they are very adaptive, um, as what Professor has mentioned. You now people don't just move houses just for the smallest reason. Of course, we look at it well. That 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 looks like a very uncomfortable living condition. But some people just adapt to it. But ports are different. Ports we need to ensure that we don't come to such a situation before we take action. So that's where preventive action takes place. And this is where the question of maladaptation sometimes arises. Uh, are we doing the right thing? Uh, in, in, in anticipating these things and eventually causing some other impact. Uh, one of it is, of course, you know, we, we, when we talk about uh, automation in ports, uh, many ports are moving towards complete automation. Uh, and a lot of ports have got this principle uh, and understanding that automation is the way forward to address climate change, to address efficiency and, and to address even labor issues. But at the same time, we have to be careful with the, uh, that is the right directions for, for a right direction for many of us, because you know things have to evolve to a certain extent before we take, take a certain uh, action. So uh, what I'm saying is, yes, that could be an answer. Automation could be an answer for most of our mishaps today but they are not entirely going to be resolving all our problems. And uh, we, we need to be planning things uh, even better. So uh, while we move towards anticipating these dangers in the future, I think we, we need to look at all conditions. We need to look at all situations and, and weigh the best measures in and hope, I mean, truly hope that our calculations are correct 
and we don't end up causing another problem. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, I will I will read the questions because people are not asking. I think they are right typing there. Um, thank you very much for highlighting. Um, uh, about mal adaptation, I think uh, um, Captain Subra, you mentioned about electrification as well. But uh, sometimes uh, the electrification is good on the efficiency side, but on the generation side, we know that uh, over the last decade, uh, the coal a generation mix uh, has increased from four uh, percent to almost forty percent today over the last decade. So the increase of uh, coal in the generation mix uh, doesn't go hand in hand, hand in hand with uh, electrification, unless the electricity is generated uh, through solar panels at your facility. So, so those kind of uh, things need could be also mal adaptation uh, from a different angle. Um, I'll go to the next question. Um, this is uh, on um, uh, Malaysia too is experiencing um, uh, sea level rise. To what extent um, this problem is being factored in the port planning and development for ports? I think uh, Captain Subra has answered. You have considered this, but um, any other thoughts from uh, Dr. Uh, Zaitun uh, or Captain Subra? If you know about other ports and what they are doing, uh, you can also highlight about that. Yeah, I think if you've mentioned some some uh, techniques of what we're doing, uh, uh, of course, engineering technology is the best to address this uh, today. And uh, uh, you, know, you know, the climate change impact on ports, uh, not just from the structural point of view, uh, we also have uh, issues from even health perspective, safety perspective, and so on. So there are many areas that we are looking at. Uh, many ports around the world are facing some more immediate, some uh, not so uh, immediate. They they have a bit more time to work on this, but generally over the uh, all over the world, uh, sea level rise is a genuine problem. So it it, it all depends. Uh, we have got some good engineering technology that is coming out today, uh, and this is where we 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 think that we can address this issue. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Um, we have another question. Maybe I'll open the question to all final members. Uh, it's a very generic question. Uh, which adaptation measure, hard or soft, taken in your pot or in your case studies in, in this case, uh, would you consider effective and good value for money? An uh, example of the best practice. Of course, most of the presentations from both uh, uh, Dr. Esteban was uh, case studies and best practices. Uh, yeah. They are talking about value for money. Peru, maybe I can share a little bit. Just, yes, please, just please, uh, please. <laughs> I don't want to hog the hog the the time yeah. here. I'm sure everybody is uh, also going to appear very quickly. I think it's the small things that we need to do. Uh, you mentioned about electrification. Uh, yeah. We we know that. Sometimes the cost of financing is is uh, detrimental to some of these uh, upgrades. So we had simple things like port equipment. Can we can we start switching the the the, the lower category of port equipment like forklifts and terminal tracks uh, tractors and so on? And uh, this is something that uh, is very important because this is where the payback will be uh, for some immediate uh, results. So both the terminals, Northport and Westport, has already embarked on this. Uh, the other thing is, of course, on lighting. I mean, simple thing is lighting, rainwater harvesting, uh, and so on. These are some of these things. Uh, maybe it may appear a bit expensive at the beginning, but once they are in, they kick in. Uh, I think then you can see your savings in terms of electricity consumption as well as uh, even water consumption. Uh, simple thing there where we didn't have to do much investment is by one was by regulation. You know, we had ships that were steaming into the port at very high speeds. We had small harbor crafts that were speeding through the port at high, high, high speeds. Of course, one was a safety issue. The other ones, the their their backwash and their waves were actually causing a lot of erosion to the offlying uh, islands and eventually even affecting mangroves and so on. Yeah. So when we impose a sort of a speed limit on that, we could 
see a, a difference. We could see some improvements over the years. Of course, it's very slow, but it, it helps uh, in, in, in reducing the, the impact on the shores uh, where this, uh, you know, the, this waves hit the shores and start damaging the banks and eventually start damaging the mangroves as well. So these are simple things that uh, we, can look, we could look at. Uh, I mean, you go to some ports, they're already looking at underwater noise. Uh, how underwater noise is going to affect uh, marine life. And there are ports where they actually uh, put a lot of restrictions on the speed of the ship so that it doesn't generate too much noise underwater and affect marine life. So by regulation, yes, but also we have to look at the safety of the ships, make sure we don't tell them to steam too slow and put them in danger. But at the same time, it must be able to uh, you know, accommodate for the local conditions there. Thank you. Yeah, interesting. Thank you. I think uh, we are almost reaching to the. Uh, we are almost out of time. Uh, they, um, they, I got a message until eleven forty uh, to to uh, uh, have the question and answer. Um, so I would like to um, uh, thank all the panel members for this uh, interesting discussion. Um, and I would like to say that uh, yes, adaptation uh, measures are uh, necessary. Um, in the uh, context of we are not going to meet 1.5 degrees as per the IPCC uh, AR6 report. We are all the pledges that the, the world countries has made up to uh, the, the temperature is going to 2.5. And of course, for ports, uh, um, subsidence uh, could aggravate the situation um, on top of a sea level rise that's inevitable. Thus, uh, adaptation measures is uh, crucial uh, for our uh, economic uh, development of the country. But at the same time, uh, we should not um, forget about the communities. Um, even though they are not moving from these uh, places, it's important to take note that uh, we should not uh, make their lives um, uh, more miserable than it's already there. <laughs> Uh, no, uh, especially the 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 poorer uh, the below B uh, forty group we call them in, in Malaysia. So uh, with that note, maybe I hand over back to uh, Putri Artis uh, on um, to continue the session further. Thank you very much. To and congratulations to all the panel members who who made uh, through this virtual platform today. So uh, and and um, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank Let's you. give Thank them you. a big round of applause uh, virtually. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Tirupati. So I'll take it from here. Uh, distinguished moderator and speakers, Mr. Tirupati Rao, C Captain K. Subramaniam, T.S. Dr. Nur Zaitun Yahya, Dr. Hiroshita Kagi, and Professor Miguel Esteban. We thank you so much for the fruitful and productive deliberation throughout this two hours webinar session. So without further ado, we will now once again invite Yang Bahagia Datuk Dr. Sabirin Jaffa to close our webinar session today. Please, Datuk. Uh, honorable speakers, uh, participants, ladies and gentlemen, salam sejahtera again. The webinar on climate change impacts and adaptation towards seaports development in Malaysia has come to a close. It is Mima's great honor to spend the morning exchanging views across the Indo-Pacific region. To conclude the webinar, I would like to convey my highest gratitude to the Embassy of Japan in Malaysia for your continuous support and trust in Mima's research activities. It has been an honor and pleasure for MIMA to work cooperatively with the Embassy of Japan in Malaysia. My deepest appreciation also goes to all participants who attended the seminar virtually and helped to make it a successful event. We are glad to have participants highlighting the strong interest of various stakeholders in the maritime sector to address the impacts and adaptation of climate change towards seaports development, particularly in the Indo-Pacific region. Ladies and gentlemen, with that, I would like once again to thank everyone for participating. Till we meet again, please take care and stay safe. Thank you.
Thank you, Dato. So now we have come to the end of our program. Again, before we end today's webinar, please allow us again to have a couple of your minutes of your time to have another photo session with our honorable panelists. This time with Professor Miguel. We are glad that you are able to make it in time to join us. So, <laughs> all right, to all the panelists, please switch on your camera and post this with your, with your biggest smile again. Okay. Yeah. All right, everyone's ready? Okay. All right. One, two, three. Smile. One, two, three. Thank you, everyone. All right, distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen, the Maritime Institute of Malaysia appreciates today's enthusiastic panelists as well as not to forget our honorable guests and participants for attending today's webinar on climate change impacts and adaptation towards seaport development in Malaysia. We will see you again at the upcoming events by MIMA. Stay tuned and goodbye, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, Rodri. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Putri. Thank you, Dato. See you Thank soon. Thank you so much, Mr. Tiro. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.